Hanging around, guys. I uh, hope you enjoy the talk. It's going to be a crypto talk, so for any of you crypto guys out there, some new stuff. Um, anyway, to start off, introduce myself, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm fancy look at that. Yeah, it's just uh, anybody familiar with Prezi yeah. presentation? So I had about a day and a half to try to get used to it. That's too much. It's too much? Yeah. yeah. We're not that it's, classy around here. All right, well. It was a drinking convention. Yeah. You got like 3D shit. Sure, wait. Well, I, I had you in mind when I did this, so enjoy. <laughs> It's a little trippy, but I uh, figured, you yeah, know, it was cool, something new. Most of us are suffering from the ETs, and you're going to swing stuff at us. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody get sick, just let me know. I'll slow it down. All right, uh, I've got a pretty cool job, pretty interesting uh, occupation. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a cryptographer, so I work with breaking codes, making codes, looking at uh, algorithmic design, uh, the way these work in real-world systems. Uh, but I'm also just recently uh, what they call an InfoSec media advocate at a media firm in Asheville. Literally just drove in from Asheville about 30 minutes ago. Um, so what we work on there is basically acting as a buffer between the media and the security research industry. Uh, you know, you read a lot of top 10 lists in big media, very general stuff, but a lot of the cool stuff that you hear about it, you know, like uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, some of that stuff's really neat, it just doesn't make it out there in the public. So we look for that kind of thing and try to represent that research you know, as truthfully as we possibly can and get it out there. It's stuff that, that people need to know but they wouldn't necessarily know because of the, of the gap between the general consumer and the researcher. Uh, just to give you a little idea of what I've, what I've done over the past five years. Uh, back in 2006 and 2007, I was contracted by Microsoft to look at BitLocker. And I carried on a pretty uh, intimate conversation with Niles Ferguson, who co-designed Two Fish with Bruce Schneier. Uh, he was one of the co-designers of BitLocker. And uh, what we wanted to do is sit down and look at, you know, how well this captures cryptographic goals in the real world. You know, are there side channel attacks, which there did turn out to be with, you know, cold boot attacks and RAM uh, that weren't necessarily relevant to cryptography. But we also looked at the cryptographic implementation. And, uh, you know, had to, at that time, had to give some props to Microsoft for going out and hiring a bunch of really good cryptographers because that's what they needed. Because they don't have the best track record, as everybody knows, with security. Um, so I wrote a, a piece about uh, BitLocker, and, and you know I figured I would call in somebody that knew a little bit about uh, cryptographic software. And I know everybody is familiar with Phil Zimmerman, PGP. So who's been to a key signing party once in their life? Okay, all right. Ever revoked a key? Ever signed a key you probably shouldn't have? Gotcha. No, no. All right. So at least everybody's familiar with him. He's probably the champion of champions on privacy. Uh, so I'll post some links you know, after the talk to the paper. That way you can kind of get an idea of what's, what's in his head. And he's been through quite a bit with FBI and the crypto wars and the export you know, regulations and all that sort. And a really cool opportunity I had uh, a couple years ago, uh, 07 and 08, uh, actually as far back as 06, uh, to work with Duke University. Uh, they have a program there called the Talent Identification Program where they take gifted students uh, as far down as I think fourth and fifth grade, I got to work with uh, 15, 16, 17 year olds and I wanted to put together a hands-on curriculum and the idea was to give them a broad scope of what uh, the crypto field's about in case they're interested in pursuing that in the future uh, as opposed to just an algorithmic look of Caesar ciphers and block ciphers but actually real world stuff that's going to make use of multiple disciplines like computer science, uh, mathematics and uh, who follows cryptogram Bruce Schneier newsletter. All right, so you're probably familiar with his his recent work on psychology of security, sociology of security. So that's a, it's a really new up and coming field along with the economics of security that it takes in a, a broad spectrum of disciplines. So that was a really cool thing to work on. And uh, this talk's gonna be a little bit about um, green cryptography and a project uh, called Mackerel. And this was co-developed, I'm working alongside Vincent Ryman, who you'll know is the co-designer of uh, Rheindahl, which went on to become the advanced encryption standard. So, uh, like it or not, we all use advanced encryption standard in one e-commerce platform or another. So I'm going to be going to be talking about advanced encryption standard a little bit. Uh, green cryptography. Uh, w what we looked at at that time was, uh, you know, as everybody knows, when security falls apart in practice, or especially cryptography, it's usually not because of the math itself. It's because of the implementation, and that's where things usually go wrong, uh, you know, regardless of what we're talking about in security. So what I wanted to examine at this time was. You know, where were things going wrong? Why were developers implementing poor cryptography? And what we found is that with the abundance of block ciphers, stream ciphers, hash, fu hash functions today, uh, you'd have like uh, 12 or 13 block ciphers, everything under the sun, really. And what happens when you put that all together, it complicates code. And the more complex the code is, obviously, the harder it is to analyze. 
So we want to try to develop a framework uh, for you know, securely implementing uh, only the bare essentials, what you need, what, what type of goals should you look for, and what can you do to achieve those goals without overkill. Uh, because you don't want to overdo the cryptography. The math is already good. We've perfected the math to such a high extent. We're not breaking codes like we used to. We're breaking implementation. So the focus should be on implementation. And that's what green crop cryptography was all about. Uh, you know, so cryptographic assurance, you know, when we think of assurance, we think of uh, confidence in implementations. And that's where green cryptography stepped in. Then we got to thinking about when we started the macro project uh, last year, you know, it's not just about the implementation. It's about the accessibility to the consumer. You know, implementation security only pays attention to the, the gap between cryptographers and developers. But what about the consumer? What about the usability of software like PGP? So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, accessibility problems that are just as much of a plague to security as the implementation problems. And also alignment. Um, and we're dealing with the relationship between cryptography and communication. Specifically, a model as big as the internet, you know, where does cryptography and security stand in a model that's so vast but wasn't built with security in mind from the forefront? Um, so all three of those things combined, you know, we're trying to build a big picture look at how developers should go about security uh, to make it, you know, fruitful in practice, to really realize the theory that cryptographers set out, and also make it usable and understandable by the consumer. And uh, a special uh, you know, guest, if you will, on the paper is uh, Brian Snow, who's going to be writing the forward, uh, former uh, technical director at the NSA, information assurance directorate. Uh, what's really cool about Brian is when you think of the NSA, they have this good guy, bad guy relationship with the security industry. The NSA has, has the, the upper hand, really. You know, we publish everything in the open, so they have access to everything we publish, everything they publish. NSA, on the other hand, they have access to what they publish, but we don't. So they always you know, have a little bit more to work with than we do. And, and we've never really liked that secrecy because in the security community, obviously, we're open. We're all about you know, publishing you know, the latest vulnerabilities exports. We want to beef up the field, get everybody on the same page. So what's really cool about him, you know, while he doesn't give away NSA secrets, obviously, uh, he does shed some light on, on things that he learned at the NSA, things that we can learn you know, in the consumer industry about how to build better software. So I will talk about that today. All right, so what is macro? Basically, uh, well, obviously, it's joint work with Vincent. Uh, it's a design paradigm. You know, when you look at macro, you're thinking a fish name. You're going to think two fish, blow fish. Might misconstrue that, think it's a block cipher. Uh, but as you know, uh, fish names were used during World War II to name encrypted traffic. So I figured it was a pretty cool name. And there's a reason behind macro that I'll get into later. But it is a design paradigm. It's not an algorithm. It's a framework that we put together uh, to sort of guide developers a way to, to build you know, better blueprints for how to go about and approach cryptography in real world systems. It is built on best practice and standards. And one of the goals before I even started the project, you know, if I had to design anything new whatsoever, I wasn't going to do it. Because as anybody knows, uh, cryptography takes time to earn its bones. Anything new is going to have to go through scrutiny. It's going to take years and years to develop. And I felt that we already had everything we needed in place. We just had to find a better way to package it and get it out there to the folks that need it. What macro is not, I just covered that. It's not a cryptographic primitive. It doesn't encrypt or authenticate things. Uh, it's not algorithmic by any means. It's just a framework for using all of these things properly and securely. Nothing homegrown, nothing radical. It's all based on stuff we trust and have trusted for decades. All right, so the evolution of macro. 07, 08, I started the uh, little project looking at mature and minimalist cryptography that was published with uh, IEEE Security and Privacy. And uh, here we were looking at taking very strong cryptography and minimalist ideas for implementing it. You know, what's the cheapest way we can write the fewest lines of code to get this cryptography into practice and achieve all the goals we want to achieve? And there are certain notions of security that I'll get into. I'll touch on somewhat. They're very technical, very mathematic, not really relevant uh, to the, the high level of macro, but I'll cover those to kind of give you an idea of what uh, you know, common protocols like SSH, SSL, you know, where they stand you know, in the cryptographic side of things. Uh, green cryptography, I covered that a little bit earlier. Uh, but yeah, that was the, the first real realization of mature minimalist cryptography. And the idea there was to recycle whenever and wherever possible. Um, not many folks know, at least uh, through my experience working with developers, that you can use encryption functions also for authentication in what we call a message authentication code algorithm. 
And what's nice about that is when you're looking at implementation that already has a block cipher like the advanced encryption standard, for instance, uh, you can use that for encryption authentication in a very secure composition to achieve confidentiality and integrity without it worrying about hash functions or multiple block ciphers or cascades of block ciphers. You can achieve the, the best that we have without going to all that trouble. And what I tried to instill in developers at that time is that, um, you know, TrueCrypt, as cool as it is, it offers dozens of, of choices to encrypt with. You know, is that necessary? And a lot of developers I talked to outside of the TrueCrypt ring said, well, we, we want to implement what the users want, and they want more, more this, more that, more hash functions, more to choose from. My argument there was, well, should users be making cryptographic decisions in the first place? And I think it should be secure by default. Uh, it, it might, you know, hurt some feelings, but, you know, we have a standard advanced encryption standard. I'm going to talk about the comparison with Two-Fish, Serpent, some of the other popular candidates, and uh, try to touch on some misconceptions about which one's more secure and where they get those notions from. You know, but we have secure standards, and we should use them whenever more possible because the best of the best have vetted these standards and looked at them. And, you know, cryptography really is still an art and a science. You know, we base our security on things that we can't prove. Uh, based on our knowledge, it's, it's pretty good. So we have to go with that, and we have to trust, trust the experts and their opinions on, on these problems that we base our security on. And uh, really cool uh, macro. I'm glad to be here at CarolinaCon. It's the first time we're premiering that. I wanted to do that for a couple reasons. Uh, uh, you know, you guys here in this audience, you know, uh, are very intimate. Uh, dealing with security well, with Xbox. Awesome. It's not American Beauty. It, it's, it's not. Perfect. I appreciate that. It was awesome. kind of, I kind of added some color to my slides. It's <laughs> black and white, so it's it's but cool. It was, but it was yeah. talking your adorable thing. Well, yeah. I, well, okay. In, in that case, in right. that case, okay. I see your point. That was what works. Anyway, where was I? Um, <laughs> Mackerel, Carolina Con. <laughs> yeah, Carolina Con. That That's where. That was distracting. Where was I before I caught <laughs> Anyway, all right, now that we got the, the balloon madness set aside, um, you know, you guys work very intimately with exploits and vulnerabilities. You work hands-on with security. I didn't want to pitch this to an executive conference, to managers, anything like that. I wanted to get the feedback from the people who are actually doing the dirty work uh, with code to see what you think, any ideas, any, any things you've wondered about, any problems you've had, any misconceptions maybe you've had. So I really look forward to some feedback after the talk. Uh, but uh, Carolina Con, this is my home state, so I was extra, you know, proud to present this here. Uh, but so you're getting the first scoop on mackerel. All right. <laughs> I've already, I've just started, man. That's not good. That's not a good sign. All right, assurance. This is the first of the triad of ideas that we're looking at in mackerel. When we think about assurance, you know, first we need to look at the role of a cryptographer and the role of a developer. Cryptographer deals with theory, and we can say the developer deals with practice. So we can simplify it that way for this purpose. Assurance means that we're taking what we work on in theory and we're translating that into practice. And success is, comes with the you know, security of working that theory into practice. So that's a successful example of assurance if we can achieve that. Confidence and implementations. Um, I, you know, I have a pretty regular open conversation with Brian Snow every other week or so to talk about the latest stuff in the security industry. Uh, you know, some government stuff, nothing you know, classified, obviously, but you know, he talks a lot about confidence implementations. I'm going to throw up some quotes from him a little later, but uh, in, in government systems, his idea, you know, we can't beta test on our, our customers because if something fails, we'll die. So confidence is not something, you know, it's pretty much you know, how he alluded to it, but, you know, confidence, you know, assurance wasn't an option. It was something that was a prerequisite you know, for, you know, security systems at the NSA. And uh, who better to, to look at than Brian Stone? I mean, he, he pretty much built, you know, several of their departments from the ground up. And assurance is meant to develop or to um, address the, the gap between cryptographers and developers. Cryptography is a very subtle art and science. Even if you have, you know, APIs and, and algorithms that are standardized and, and code to work with, when you do, it's a case-by-case -case basis when you deal with particular systems. Sometimes different algorithms won't fit you have to go to a smaller algorithm. When you change things around, they don't always work. It's not black and white like you might think it is. So it's very subtle, and we can't expect developers to know these things because they're, they're code gurus, they're not cryptography gurus. Everybody has their expertise, so it's up to cryptographers, you know, guys like me that do the research in that field to cater to the developer. And it, it's, it, they shouldn't be them, you know, kind of, you know, stabbing in the dark for it, and we blame the developer when things go wrong. It's, it's a, you know, a two-way street. 
All right, so yeah, everybody knows there's a lack of assurance in security. Um, unfortunately, when you think about other types of software where we test for functionality and things that work properly, you know, if this, then that, we can't beta test for security. You know, I can, I mean, I can say uh, this entire presentation has been encrypted in ROT26, and uh, I, did it, I did it very successfully. I mean, it, it is ROT26, but it's not very secure. It worked properly, but it, uh, what's that? Double ROT13. Double ROT13, there you go. That's even, yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you kind of get the idea. Things can work properly, but not necessarily securely. Okay, Brian Snow from 2005. It's a paper he wrote uh, for a keynote speech called We Need Assurance. Brian said, I want functions and assurances in a security device. We do not beta test on the customer. If my product fails, someone might die. You know, and, and the security industry hasn't really seen the type of liability that it should have. Um, in the NSA, I can, I can only imagine what would happen if you were behind the code uh, that uh, led to someone losing their life. You know, I'm not sure what their, their policies are there, but you know, I kind of think we need to lean more towards this, this idea to assume people are gonna die you know, if Microsoft Word crashes. You know, probably not going to happen, but, uh, but that, that wouldn't be a bad metric to go by. It wouldn't be a bad way to look at design, uh, to think that if your spreadsheet falls apart, you're going to lose a loan. But, uh, sure, yeah, yeah you, know, we, you know. Another quote from Brian. Uh, the software security industry today is at about the same stage as the auto industry was in the 1930s. Lots of performance, little safety. Both cars and software, the issue is really assurance. So it's, it's really neat to look at uh, you know, different examples of different industries, the car industry. And there's so many parallels we can draw between different you know, areas of industry and security. And I think we need to do that. It, it's time that we look at other disciplines to better security. We'd be surprised at how intertwined different sciences are when we start looking at the process for going about safety and security. Any questions so far? Sure. Oh, of course. You know, I, I think with uh, with cryptography, it's tricky. You've got you've got um, you know when you look at standards, you've got corporate interest. You've got so many other things that come into play between the independent researcher field and governments and militaries and corporations. It, it's going to take a lot of work, and, and anything in cryptography takes a lot of time to mature. It takes a lot of time sitting around a table discussing ideas. Everybody's got their hand in something. So I think in that case, you're absolutely right, and we can't. We can't draw directly from those things. We can't look at exactly what they did and expect it to translate over. And some things may not work at all. I mean, that'd be like saying everybody who needs access to the internet needs to have a driver's license or you know, an internet driver's license. Sure, exactly. So I mean, you know, obviously things don't translate, uh, you know, completely. I think it's worth taking a look at seeing, you know, what does. And it is fun for topic anyway. Oh, yeah. All right, uh, the cryptographer developer gap. And as I said earlier, uh, cryptography is very subtle. Uh, for example, CBC mode, it's a very strong mode. It's, it's secure and chosen plain text attack model. It's probably the most widely used block software mode. Everybody's familiar with it, probably used it at one time or another. And they may think in a real world system if they encrypt something with CBC that you're gonna get confidentiality. And it's not always the case, especially when you're dealing with network traffic. Now, Steve Bellavin, uh, uh, you know, big time security guru, uh, really a champion in the field. He demonstrated, you know, early 90s, mid 90s attacks on IPsec, you know, where about, um, adversaries were able to read encrypted traffic by exploiting the issue that authentication wasn't applied properly. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about encryption authentication. Authentication is that forgotten about element that's probably even more important in some cases than encryption because encryption can fall apart completely without it. So things like that we can expect developers to know because it's very cryptographic. It, it goes to deep level math, computer science about the way you, you know, forge messages, the way you decrypt messages. So this is the kind of thing we need to get out to developers. A quote uh, from that same paper, it's quite clear that encryption without integrity checking is all but useless. We strongly urge all systems uh, to use the two options. Really strong quote from 96. Uh, I lived in Brazil for about a year, and while I was there I did a project, uh, mostly American and Canadian companies, uh, developers of cryptographic software. And what I did is I looked at small independent uh, companies where you could tell it was a one-man show. This guy developed games, he developed, you know, calendars, and he just happened to like cryptography, so he threw together a little cryptography app and charged $9.95 for it. Then I went to the mid-level guys who actually had a nice website. They had a suite of cryptographic products. You know, they used standards, lots of buzzwords, and then I went to the big guys like PGP, 
you know, when I asked them questions about encryption authentication, I said, you know, this, this isn't mentioned on your site. You know, you don't mention anything about uh, authentication, but you claim you know, to achieve integrity. Uh, I would say a good 95% of the response I got back was that no, we either do not know what a MAC algorithm is for message authentication, um, there hasn't been a demand for it. Uh, we think our implementation of encryption only is serving that purpose. There are lots of different answers, and some didn't respond at all. Uh, but, you know, this was 1996. I did this little study a couple years ago, and out of about 40, 45 to 50 people that I interviewed, different companies from small to large, from one man to, to big corporations, only the biggest and the best of the corporations have actually had the money to go out and hire good security people, good professionals, good cryptographers, even had a clue what I was talking about, let alone implemented things properly. So there is definitely a gap. And there's no, I mean, you, you think about, you know, for example, if I wanted to practice medicine today, I'd have to go through a whole a scheme of things to practice medicine. I couldn't open up a clinic on the, the side of the street out here and start offering, you know, medical advice and things of that sort. But in cryptography online, anybody that has a piece of code can develop software, can sell it. They can use all the buzzwords. And, and why not use it when it's using military-grade cryptography and one million bit keys and you know the NSA cried when we released this you know buzzwords like that you know why not use it and then that, that further looks at the developer to consumer gap um, which is even you know equally important if not more all right uh, touch on green cryptography which is it, it's an extension of the assurance green cryptography aims to simplify the implementation process for developers and simplify analysis for the implementation itself the, the idea here is obvious. We want to make things as easy as possible for the developer to understand, you know, to interface with the code, to understand what cryptography they need and how to go about it. You know, no hidden, you know, hidden things along the way. And because implementation is where things usually go wrong, we wanted to simplify the analysis and implementation as much as possible. You know, cryptography, it, it's great stuff, but if implementation is faulty, you can get around the cryptography. So that's really where the focus should be. People tend to become paranoid about cryptography. They worry about NSA, Big Brother, capabilities like that when, you know, examples like, you know, different sorts of implementations are falling apart every other day, and not because of Big Brother, but because of simple exploits that you can automate and do in, you know, a matter of seconds. So green cryptography, first recycle whenever and wherever possible. We looked at encryption, authentication. When you think of integrity checking, you might think of a hash function. And hash functions are good. There's no problem using it if you use a standard. But we wanted to try to take a step further. Can we get by with one primitive? So we looked at the advanced encryption standard. Maybe a little biased since I was working with Vincent Ryman on this project, the co-developer of the AES. But uh, you know, I figured it was, it was a standard. People were familiar with it, so we would go with it. And we wanted to make sure you're taking that too? Oh, yeah, just for a second. <laughs> okay. Le just, leave me. Just till it's okay. <laughs> leave me. Leave me a cup at least. I want to go. Pass. No. No. I'm cool. I'm cool. Yeah. All right. So uh, recycle. <laughs> That's bad. I can smell it and that'll do the trick. Yeah, no, it'll float to the it's top. Contact. All right. I think I might wait. Between this and the, the effects here. That's, that's <laughs> anyway, recycle whenever and wherever possible. Uh, we looked at the master encryption standard and we you know we found I mean it was it was known to cryptographers, it's a very, very common thing. Uh, what we call a, comp a generic composition. And what this is is a way to combine encryption and authentication together. And the benefit of this is when you when you you can either authenticate first, then encrypt, encrypt first, then authenticate, or encrypt and authenticate separately. And there are different security notions to go along with this, but encrypting first, then authenticating second, is uh, uh, you know widely believed to be the most secure. It's the, it's the least likely to go wrong in practice. So we use the AES to encrypt, and then in a MAC algorithm to authenticate. And this in this form, you know, properly done, of course, using let's say CBC mode or you know, for a Mac using CMAC or OMAC or one of the other standardized forms of, of message authentication. We're able to achieve indistinguishability under adaptive chosen ciphertext attacks and integrity of ciphertext. And this is really the strongest notions we have available uh, since about, I think, in the last decades when that, that sort of thing was developed, you know, theoretical uh, security, notions of security. And it's based on different models. Not everybody agrees with it, but we think it's a good starting point. It's a good way to uh, to look at, uh, you know, what would happen if we throw a barrage of attacks. It's sort of a, a baseline metric 
you know, in real world security, if we think about chosen ciphertext attacks where the attacker can choose the ciphertext, can plant the ciphertext, have us decrypt ciphertext of his choosing, and obviously do the same thing with plain text. So they're, they're baseline models. So we went with the strongest, which is, you know, all encompassing. Uh, mature cryptography, you know, using only standards, only strong cryptography, minimalist implementation, had a few maxims to go along with it, uh, you know, like do a lot with a little, less is more. Little thing, little self-coaching things to, to keep us on track to make sure things were as clean and neat as possible. And obviously the goal is to maximize security, minimize complexity. Um, you know, one thing we see in cryptographic software, and I'm going to pick on TrueCrypt a little bit, even though it's probably secure, a lot of people use it, it's probably seen a following that no other software has since PGP, uh, but they use a lot. They use uh, dozens of block ciphers, uh, several hash function options. They offer the ability to cascade, to, to really pile on the cryptography. And as I alluded to earlier, the problem with this is that it, it really addresses, you know, a non-problem, and that's beefing up cryptography. We don't need to beef up cryptography. It's very good. It's very secure. We need to worry about the implementation. And the more stuff you stick into an implementation, the more complex it becomes. So that's really something we've tried to pound into developers, is that, you know, the more cryptography, not the better. The, the fewer things you have in the implementation, that's where your real, real world security is going to come into practice. Going back to that composition, when you encrypt, and this is something that Steve Bellowin said as well, uh, when you encrypt, you should authenticate to. That's a rule. There's really uh, no case. Uh, you know, when dealing with disk encryption, you know, when you're limited on space, the idea of, of putting a MAC tag or an extra little chunk of text on the end of the ciphertext, that expands it. And sometimes expansion is not really favored upon when you're dealing with disk encryption. But there are certain ways to go about that, different modes of operation. Uh, that address what we call granularity. And granularity, when you're thinking about an attacker being able to manipulate bits on a drive, 128 bits seems like a lot, but it's, it's a, a, rather large, a rather small space. When you're dealing with segments of 128-bit blocks along the way, he may be able to you know, twiddle a few bits here and there without damaging you know, an entire sector or an entire disk. So they looked at, uh, you know, cryptographers looked at different ways to increase this block link using traditional block ciphers. So they found ways to use 128-bit block ciphers like the advanced encryption standard and expand that to work over, you know, maybe, you know, several thousand bits worth of block space. And by doing this, uh, you know, it's not a perfect way for authentication. It's not as ideal as a Mac. But what it does is it makes it more likely that any manipulation will crash the disk by covering a larger amount of space than to allow the attacker to do anything useful. And we call that poor man's authentication. You know, it's not really authentication, but it, it, you know, it lessens the chance of disaster should somebody try to break the integrity. <laughs> Some of these are somewhat uh, able to recover you know, from small amounts of manipulation with the ones that cover larger block sectors. You know, the idea there is it's sort of twofold. You I mean, you kind of risk you know, losing stuff on a disk you know, at the expense of added security. And that's one thing that BitLocker did. Um, I have to look into more about, uh, you know, what they did to avoid that. And they had some other bells and whistles they put in with BitLocker as far as, you know, trusted platform and all that, things to make it, you know, a little more friendly. But, um, you know, BitLocker did that with AES and CBC mode. They expanded it over a larger block, and they were pretty successful with it. You know, despite the cold boot attacks, cryptographically, it was about as good as it was going to get, you know, without affecting performance too much. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. All right, um, for those who like algorithms, this type of overview, encrypt and authenticate. This is a generic composition. You know, you're dealing, you have a first algorithm K for your key generation. You want to split those keys, generate one key source, split the keys, the first half for encryption, second half for authentication. It's a, you know, pseudo-random string, so there's probably not a lot of correlation between the bits. Uh, the encryption algorithm, pretty simple, plain and simple. Using the encryption key, you encrypt the plain text. Then, with the other key, the shared authentication key, you compute a MAC tag on that ciphertext. You send this along. Uh, what happens here is, you know, if Alice sending it to Bob, she computes a MAC tag on the ciphertext. When Bob receives the message, he uses the same key, the same MAC algorithm, computes a ciphertext a tag, compares it to what Alice sent. If they match, then you have integrity. So this is a really basic uh, generic composition. Uh, when used with standards, used properly, this achieves the highest level of security we have for symmetric uh, encryption and authentication. And uh, there were several uh, Indian and uh, some students from Thailand that did a lot of work with this about a decade ago. And they're really the only ones working on it, but they're, they're super smart. 
and they, they work hand in hand with the cryptographic, you know, the theoretical side of security. So it's really, it really is a trusted generic composition. Uh, since it deals with things like um, provable security, that's really one of those words in, in cryptography, it's, it's a misnomer. You know, we really can't prove security the way many people might think 100% of the time. But we can prove that if we can break A, then we can also break B. So when we look at low level primitives, things like you know, a block cipher and something higher level like a mode of operation, a CBC, that uses that block cipher. You know, if we can break CBC using this attack, then we can also break the AES using this attack. So that's really what they, they go about with models like this for you know, provable security. We can prove that if this breaks, then that's gonna break too. It's not 100%, but it's about as good as we can get. And finally, for the green cryptography side, you know, we must consider simplicity and security as mutually beneficial you know, parts of system design because security is not just about the technology like cryptography that's going into the implementation. It's just as much about the implementation itself because we're not dealing with theory. If we're dealing with theory only, you know, cryptography uh, theorists have it in a really good position. They can pick and choose their attackers. They can pick and choose their models. Things always work great in theory. But dealing with practice, practice, it's an uphill battle. Things work against you in practice in real world models. So both of these things have to work in tandem. Um, Peter Gutman, I think most of you should probably uh, know of him from 35 pass, you know, disk wipe method uh, back in the day. Uh, he's from New Zealand, a really hardcore security guy. Um, I used to have regular conversations with him. He proposed a, a security paradigm of sorts. You know, there is only one way and that is secure and it's also the easiest way to um, not really an easy thing to do in practice since it, it involves multiple disciplines, as I'll allude to now. You know, you're dealing with, with the, um, the consumer of that, the user interface. You're dealing with, like, human-computer interaction, which in and of itself has nothing to do with security, but they look at how we interface as humans with different things with technology. So it's important that we, we reach out to these other communities to look at how to design security and make it easy to use. All right, now that I got assurance out of the way, any questions about assurance, green cryptography? Go. All right, accessibility. Uh, this was really the start of Mackerel. Um, you know, we, we looked at the insurance first, implementation security, but we realized that was only the start. It only took care of the, the relationship between cryptographers and developers. With accessibility, the implementation actually has to be usable. Um, Alma Witten, who's a researcher now with Google, she did a study back in, uh, I think it was, late 90s, 1999, it was called Why Johnny Can Encrypt. It was a usability study of PGP. And she found that even though this was the first time, it was a really, you know, PGP was a great thing. It was the first time we had an interface for, for really strong cryptography that 90% of her search studies uh, either exported their secret key and sent it to somebody and it took them 90 minutes to do that or they just couldn't generate public keys at all. And a very select few people, usually undergraduate students, people that they were somewhat tech savvy you know, with those, in those interfaces of the day were able to, to find their way through it. But it still took, you know, a considerable amount of time, a, a, a period of time that people are not going to wait for today. You know, and uh, with Mackerel, we thought about, you know, tactile and palatable concepts. Security should feel good. It should taste good, you know, for lack of better terms. Um, you know, when dealing with cryptography, we have to look at ways to not focus on encryption, authentication. You know, if you ask your grandmother what encryption is, she's probably not going to know. But uh, if you ask her what confidentiality is. Well, she's lived her whole life and she's developed trust models with different people. So she knows what confidentiality is, you know, what it's not. So she can relate to concepts like that. And these are the types of everyday consumers that are actually going to be using, you know, secure software. And we want to make it transparent, but we also want to make it clear why they need the software and what it's going to do. When they look at the interface, they're going to know, okay, this is going to provide confidentiality. It's going to provide integrity. They, didn't, they need not worry about, you know, advanced encryption standard authentication. This, you know, box art for this. You know, there's some unfortunate certainties for us as developers. Security is usually secondary. Most people, when they sit down to a computer, they're not thinking about hardening their machine. Now, that may be very untrue for the people in this room. You know, as security researchers, that might be the first thing they think about. But what are we going to do when you sit down on a computer? World of Warcraft, maybe. Check email. Some other things I probably shouldn't mention. But, uh, you know, the first thing is usually not security. Uh, inconvenience trumps security every time, and that's one of the things I talked about with, with Niles Ferguson at Microsoft when they were developing BitLocker. He said, you know, we could have gone, you know, above and beyond with the cryptography. We could have made things as ideal as possible, but it was going to slow down the process. 
and with an interface as ubiquitous as Windows and given the users that use Windows on a regular basis, they don't really give a lot of time, you know, when they're, when they're working with different applications. So he said it's going to slow things down to such a point that users are just going to forget about the cryptography. They're not going to worry about disk encryption because of the lag. It's going to slow down, you know, disk, uh, disk time, you know, reading and writing and things of that sort. So it, it probably always will be true. Uh, we're, in any design where cryptography is not there from the very beginning, security is always going to lose to convenience. And obviously, if it's difficult to use, users not going to have any motivation. You know, they're going to forget security altogether. And Alvin Witten, who's done uh, the bulk of the early research in the usability of privacy, she said, secure software is usable if people that are expected to use it are reliably aware of the security tasks they need to perform. They're able to figure out how successfully to perform those, those tasks. Uh, they don't need to make dangerous errors and they need to be sufficiently comfortable with the interface to continue using it. And these were you know, early principles that she set out to try to correct PGP. And you know, they've done some things here and there, but largely research like this, you know, research like Alan Witten, as prolific as they are in human-computer interaction, the security industry really has no idea, uh, for the most part, who she is. There are a lot of researchers that you know, have no idea that Alan Witten is pioneering a field as important to security as what cryptographers are doing because she's addressing the interface. She's addressing the real world a point where users meet security. And this is just as important um, you know, as cryptographers who are developing the beginning, the theory that goes into that. So these four points are you know, a really good way, uh, sort of a baseline way to approach you know, usable design. And we call this blue cryptography, you know, accessibility, blue, you know, sort of an international color for accessibility. With blue cryptography, we want to simplify the conceptual model. When we think in technical terms, we think of encryption, authentication. In conceptual terms, we can look at this as confidentiality and integrity. And this is a really crucial way uh, for myself as a cryptographer to interact with someone in human-computer interaction because they're dealing with concepts, they're dealing with tangible, you know, palatable things, things that are going to make the user understand what's going on in the software. You know, from my perspective, I'm worried about the security of an algorithm, the interface, that's an entirely different beast. So we need to come together <coughs> And I think this is where we meet, is taking you know, technical concepts or technical aspects of a design and turning that into something conceptual. Uh, and obviously, you know, the more general the concept, it's more accessible to the everyday user. You know, folks like you and I have no problem with encryption authentication, but the more general we can make it, the more likely it is to be used you know, by consumers in practice. You know, first things first, transparency. Users should be able to use a system transparently. You know, as much as you can do behind the scenes, you know, with PGP, you're actively encrypting email, and you have to generate the keys. Uh, there are still some things we can automate and we can do behind the scenes, you know, rather than expect them um, to not go into a fit when it asks them to peck on their keyboard and move the mouse around to generate randomness, because then they're freaking out. It's like, you know, I'm, it's, 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 it's not a very natural thing to ask a user to do, to shake their mouse and bang on their keyboard. They already don't like the software at that point anyway. So transparency is key. And again... They don't again, like how they already use their PC to be validated. What's that? They don't like how they already use their PC Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, well, for some, and until, the, until the blood comes, and then, it, then it's, yeah, it's a whole different thing. And, uh, you know, I don't feel, and a lot of researchers don't feel, that, that users should be given crypto decisions to make. And, uh, you know, I used to participate on different forums, like SciCrypt, uh, TrueCrypt forum, and a lot of the users got pretty heated when I told them they didn't need cascaded block ciphers. They went into rants that made it seem like they were directors at the NSA at one time. I mean, you could literally see the tenfold hats coming out. I mean, it was, it was hardcore, and they were already going to the bunker before I finished my conversation. So, I mean, it was, it was something. You know, they're like, well, what, what if this breaks? What if they break this? Well, if I have ten block ciphers, you know, if they break the first nine, I'm okay. I'm like, well, let's look to history for some examples. Let's look to where things usually go wrong. You know, back as, as far as World War II, you know, with the Enigma, you know, a lot of that, you know, the, the Enigma was pretty, pretty secure for that time period, one of the most secure cryptographic devices we'd ever seen. But uh, user error, a lot of things outside of cryptography itself, um, you know, the reason the things went wrong, they, they broke, you know, different side channels. They, they, you know, relied on user error to find their way in. You know, so users shouldn't be given crypto decisions to make. And, and we're trying to, to bridge that gap to show that the advanced encryption standard, you know, the same type of folks are going to believe it is a standard by NIST, therefore it must be tainted in some way by the NSA. 
And, uh, you know, I personally can't say, I wouldn't put my life on it, that there's not some hidden weakness. I don't believe there is. I don't think there's uh, any necessarily uh, use for the NSA, especially considering cryptography is such an international field today. You know, cryptography wasn't invented, invented by Americans, and putting export laws on cryptographic code makes it seem like we're trying to keep math within the borders of the United States. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but, you know, back when crypto was a munition, I mean, it certainly made sense to some people. But anyway, you know, it's, it's something we've, we've kind of worked ourselves out of now. You know, we can export things to a certain degree. Uh, certain few countries we can't export to, at least we shouldn't. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the AES is good alone, and it, it's really tough to try to convince users of that. It's, trying to, it's tough trying to convince them that a bare-bones security installation is going to do just as good of a job as something that's, that's got, uh, you know, 10 armored jackets on top of it that would stop, you know, armor-piercing bullets. You know, that's the kind of security they want and they think they're not getting, you know, from standards like the advanced encryption standard. Anybody from the NSA that'll admit to it? Okay. Good. All right, with blue cryptography, you know, just as with green cryptography, we have to consider, you know, simplicity and security together. We have to consider privacy and usability. You know, when we think of security, sometimes we think, you know, this is meant to be complex. This is not meant to be interfaced with. Well, the truth is it is meant to be interfaced with. And the reason things go, go wrong is not just because the implementation falls apart, it's also because the user doesn't know how to use the implementation correctly, or they click a checkbox here that accidentally exports the secret key which they send out to the key server, or things like that that aren't obvious that come into play. So that has to be you know, a design problem to look at. Alignment. And as I don't know if you, you noticed, but things are becoming a lot more open-ended. You know, with green cryptography, we're dealing with standards. It's, it's, it's based on standards, best practice. There's really not to qu much to question there. With blue cryptography, we're dealing with two fields that haven't really come together so much yet. There's a select few people working on it. I know Carnegie Mellon University. Any Carnegie Mellon students here by any chance? Anybody know any students from Carnegie Mellon? Okay. Are you familiar with uh, Scilab? Okay. So Scilab, you know, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff with usability and privacy. But what's alarming about that is that you have one university, and almost every time you search for things in this domain, it's bringing up Carnegie Mellon. You'd kind of like to see some other people pitching in. So that kind of tells you how much in its infancy it really is. So in that sense, it's very open-ended. We don't know a lot about it yet. We're very new. Um, alignment's even uh, much more of a problem because it deals with cryptography and communication. You know, when we think of communication, we look back to Claude Shannon, you know, one of the pioneers of communication. And a lot of what he says still rings true today. I mean. Practically, the you know, digital revolution, we owe it to the guy. Uh, but communication has really evolved in such a way, especially with the Internet, that security hasn't been built you know, as a component from the, from the very beginning. You know, we have certain models. That are, you know, if you look at a lot of code, a lot of security protocols, you know, they're, they're outdated, they're, they're very old, they're legacy type things. It would be too expensive to change, but we didn't know better at the time. So we need to look at you know, what are our limitations with cryptography and communication. You know, are we getting the most for our money? You know, what, what can we do and what can we not do? And this is even more open-ended because we're going to reach a point where without redesigning the Internet, we're going to have, you know, caps. We're going to have a ceiling, and we're going to have to look at ways to, to, to not be ideal but to be secure in practice, and that's when things get tricky, sort of expensive. You know, we lose our minds, you know, trying to, to come up with ad hoc ways to use standards when we shouldn't have to. All right, so as I said, alignment looks at the relationship between cryptography and communication. And when we think of uh, the two together, I want you to think about you know, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And this is a, a hierarchy. It's, it, it receives a lot of criticism because there, it's really hard to, to look at and determine what knowledge is, what wisdom is, how to you know, differentiate between the two. I'm not going to try to do that today, but just to look at where cryptography fits into that and where communication fits into that, you know, where cryptography falls short. All right, so this hierarchy, starting with data. You know, we can think of data as raw symbols, and this is very simplified, but it works for this purpose. So with, with raw symbols, you know, A, B, C, one, two, three, question marks, things of that sort. Information, we start to look at uh, the relationship between different symbols when we put them together. So if we concatenate, you know, those different letters, we get Raleigh. All right, and those numbers, we get a zip code for Raleigh. That is a zip code for Raleigh, right? That is, okay, just make sure I'm not making a fool of myself here. All right, so knowledge. Um, again, it's very tough to define knowledge, but we can say that it's useful information. You know, when we find out what Raleigh is, then we can determine it's a city. 
then it becomes useful. Raleigh by itself, not very useful as a word. doesn't do much for me at least. But if I know it's Raleigh, then I can find my way to Carolina Con, and that's a pretty good thing since I was on the schedule for tonight. Woo. Yeah, a little late, but uh, I made it, yeah. Not as useful as I'd hoped, but still, still pretty useful. All right, um, and then wisdom. We could say wisdom is effective knowledge. You know, once I learn that Raleigh is a city, I can get out the map, get out MapQuest. I can look at the, the fastest way, the best way to get to Raleigh in a short amount of time. So I'm using this knowledge. I'm, I'm honing the knowledge in ways that it can be more effective than just knowing, you know, where Raleigh is, what Raleigh is. So this is sort of the, the idea we use when we, we look at the relationship, you know, between cryptography and communication. From a cryptographer's perspective, when we're designing a, a cryptographic algorithm, the data part, we want to make sure that the bit is unrecognizable from a random bit. It's a very basic property. We want it to be indistinguishable from, from random noise. Uh, and the way we do this with you know, pseudo-random you know, properties of an algorithm, it's not perfect, but it's cryptographically secure. So we're, we've pretty, pretty much got that down pat. Information, we want to make sure they can't estimate the distribution of bits. We don't want them to find out, well, this has more ones and zeros. What does that mean? You know, can we, uh, what can we learn from that? And I'll go into more of that in just a few minutes. Knowledge, we want to make sure they can't recover the encrypted the knowledge. And, and basically, uh, using the distribution of bits, we want to make sure they don't gain any, any effective, any useful information from that to start you know, honing in on the plain text. Wisdom, we want to make sure the cryptanalyst, or the, the attacker in this case, has no understanding of what they observe. You know, when they look at something and they see a distribution of bits, we want to make sure it looks random. We, want, we don't want them to see any patterns. Um, and that's where the, the definitions get a little tricky, and that's where things fall apart, unfortunately, for, for cryptography. From a cryptanalyst, and when I say cryptanalyst, I mean I'm, I'm thinking about the person breaking the code. Uh, it's not really a malicious term, but uh, we're thinking cryptographer, good guy, cryptanalyst, bad guy. All right, data. You know, going back to making the bits, you know, indistinguishable from random. You know, what is the fifth symbol in a message? You know, if they if they're able to pick out and learn where different bits are in a message, then they've, they've got a format together. You know, they know what bits are going to be in what place. So that's what they're going to look for there. Uh, information. Are there, are there more ones and zeros in this message? Is there ever a sequence? You know, that sort. You know, they've started to identify uh, relationships among symbols, and they're able to pick out actual, you know, snippets of a binary in a code that can lead to breaking, you know, eventually breaking the plain text or at least, you know, leaking parts of the key, different levels of attack. All right, knowledge. Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, Kevin McCurley, who's also with Google now, has done most of the work, and that's, that sums up to about one paper on the relationship between cryptography and communication. And there's some others that are, that are working on it here recently. I think there's a paper coming out looking at, um, uh, I think, phonetic hacking of VoIP encryption calls, and we'll try to find out some more of that later today. Um, but with knowledge, you know, if you look at information and you're picking out you know, snippets of code, different languages have different types of distributions. You know, different languages have they use uh, one letter more than the other, and that's, that's, it differentiates between you know, English to French to German. So if you can find out what language is being spoken, like Portuguese, German, English, what have you, then you're on to something there. And a lot of times you can do this by looking at the distribution of lots of code. Uh, you can look at you know, how these compare between different languages, and you can you know, work your way towards an attack from there. Uh, wisdom, you know, did Alice just ask Bob a question or give a command? You know, when we're looking at encrypted traffic, you know, uh, when we think about context, if I, you know, ask a question, you know, it may not always be apparent, you know, what that question is about. So context is really important in the wisdom side of things. If we can learn the context, we can make use of the data at hand. And that's also where things get really tricky for cryptography. Uh, you know, cryptography just doesn't work well at the knowledge and wisdom level. You know, because information leaks, because we have context and residue, things like metadata, you know, we can't, you know, we can't really apply mathematical algorithms to that the way we do with data. You know, we can encrypt metadata, but we can't always learn, or we can't always prevent an adversary from learning context about, you know, who developed that software? You know, can we learn more about the company behind the software? What bad track record do they have? What types of exploits do they leave open that we can automatically look for? This is not something for cryptography to handle, unfortunately. But it is something that uh, is important to communication. Uh, some quotes from Kevin McCurley in that paper. Um, you know, his take is that all current models of security fail to incorporate good models of communication. We need better models of communication in order to advance cryptology, and we need better defini definitions of knowledge and wisdom in order to advance cryptology. And now you're looking at uh, fields, domains like uh, philosophy, when you're looking at things like knowledge and wisdom. 
you know, cryptographers and developers and you know, code monkeys don't sit around and, and ponder the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Maybe after a few cups of that, but uh, <laughs> in, in general, you know, we don't worry about it. It's it's really, really a, a I don't know, very open-ended type of discussion. Uh, but that's important. We need to know uh, McCurley's words. We need to know what knowledge and wisdom are in this relationship in order to advance the field. Otherwise, you know, the cryptography gets stronger, but we're not we're not fixing those contextual and residual holes where we're learning about you know who's behind the code. Uh, you know, patterns, things we can look forward to that aren't related to cryptography, but we can use as side channels to find our way in. And, uh, you know, in the paper, um, communication fragmented, and that's what I mean by, you know, context and residue. Well, five minutes? Cool, okay. I didn't realize I was talking that long. Less than five minutes, wow. Okay. All right, uh, I'll get hurry up. All right, uh, I'm going to speed through these even more. But, you know, human language broken into syllables and words, written communication broken into paragraphs, chapters, what have you, movies broken into frames, internet communication, packet switch. So everything we do as far as communication is really segmented, it's fragmented. And if I have some data here, it may not mean much, but if I can figure out the context of earlier conversations that may not be protected or things I've hacked earlier, or, you know, when we have a data process, sometimes that generates residue somewhere in a temporary file, things of that sort. If I can get my hands on that, what come after that, what come before it, I can learn stuff and leak information about the data the, at focus. And the idea there is we shouldn't just consider the focal data. The stuff we want to encrypt, that's not enough. We should con you know, con uh, consider the contextual fragments, like the metadata that gives it meaning, and we, can, we should consider the residue. Uh, residue can be anything like a temporary file when you generate, I don't know, who works with uh, LaTeX uh, typesetting software? LaTeX. LaTeX, okay. 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 LaTeX. Anyway. <laughs> LaTeX? Like La I, okay. I had a very French professor. LaTeX. LaTeX, okay. Oh, I hate it. Okay. <laughs> LaTeX, is that better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. LaTeX. <laughs> LaTeX. Yeah. And now Anyway, with uh, LaTeX, you know, when you, when you typeset a document, it's going to generate some, some other residual files with some other types of information in it. And, you know, lots of applications do this. And this stuff's not always protected, usually not. So we can learn information about the process given this residual data. And we have to consider that. And that's not really easy uh, uh, given, you know, the lack of attention that's given to cryptography and communication. We just don't really have a good idea how to go about it. And what we're finding is that uh, the limitations of what we can do are far far less what we really hope they are. Uh, Yoshi Kono, um, he co-wrote uh, Cryptographic Engineering with Niles Ferguson and Bruce Schneier. Uh, he's with the University of Washington, really you know, well-known cryptographic researcher. He was able to break WinZip because it didn't encrypt file names, it didn't encrypt metadata. Now, WinZip used to encrypt and authenticate composition that we use in Macro, very secure. In fact, it was the most secure way you could do encryption authentication uh, possibly using what we have today, and that's what WinZip used. So they at least understood that part. They just didn't understand that apparently that information can be leaked from metadata, or that I can look at a file name and automatically know exactly what type of information is in that file, even if I can't read it. So that's why that's important to really look at. You know, just as humans, we have peripheral vision. You know, I'm focused here, but I can still see out here. You know, that's a, that's a human trait. It's very important. We can see a lot of bad things coming thanks to peripheral vision. So I think with security, it pays designers to use that same type of peripheral vision when they're looking at data. Also consider, you know, what's in and around data. All right, obviously the alignment should be, should be considered. And uh, kind of close out here. Uh, let's see, I don't have, how much time do I have for questions? Two minutes. Two minutes for questions? Okay, <laughs> my apologies. All right, and what we found that was really beautiful about Mackerel, you know, we were doing something new. We were packaging well-known stuff in a way that was new, a way that was more accessible. But looking back at the Shannon Weaver model of communication, they laid out three things, technical, semantic, effectiveness. How to accurately communicate a message, technical problem, that aligned perfectly with assurance. How to accurately does our language convey the meaning we want and we intend, that's semantic, that deals with accessibility. In alignment, obviously, you know, how effective is that communication? So, you know, what we're finding is things, th things are so intertwined. It goes, you know, back 50, 60 years to basic principles that we've already known, and we just haven't learned how to put them together. And I think that's, that was really the, the most crucial part of this, this whole project, is to see that we were on the right track. Our, our fundamentals were what they have been all along, 
Uh, we just didn't realize, you know, that we needed to change the way we, we you know, allow accessibility for it. All right, so got a couple minutes. This is a sort of like a family tree. I don't know if you can actually read the text on it, but of things that are recycled from the advanced encryption standard. And you might be able to see uh, like Whirlpool hash function, uh, two fish, things like that. It's just to show how widely components that went into advanced encryption standard are recycled. And what's really important about that is to show that uh, for the naysayers of the AES, you know, a lot of the other uh, prime you know, cryptographic primitives use a lot of the same techniques. So it's nothing foreign, it's nothing that we should necessarily be worried about because it's based on you know, decades of, of secure components. And I'll have these available to, to download later so you can go through them. And this is the same type of thing for the, the SHA-3 hash function candidates. Uh, the AES Xbox, uh, the actual AES round, you know, so you got a, a huge chunk of the hash function candidates are pulling directly from the advanced encryption standard. So that, that just shows the confidence that researchers have worldwide. And I'll skip these. All right, uh, okay, any questions for the one minute? Please, uh, okay, was that, uh, is that covered by any sort of licensing? Or it it's not. So and it's like CCM? Like CCM? Oh, okay, I was thinking you talking about the mode of operation, no, no, CCM, no. which is not, but I, yeah, I get you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. And it's based on uh, standards, best practice. So it's based on things that are already, you know, free of any royalties, free of any license. Are you going to be pursuing, like, ISO certification or something for it? Or, or, uh... You know, I don't know. I think it's still very early. I mean, because of how open-ended the accessibility and the alignment factors are, you know, we're going to have to reach out to these departments and really boost that research first before we can really get the attention of groups, government groups. Haven't yet. We're just we're just finishing this research up, but uh, it's something to definitely consider. Please. Maybe we can chat about it later and see if you got any good ideas. Good stuff, yeah. All right. All right. Good. When I say crypto decisions, I don't want users to, to try to debate between which is most secure, advanced encryption standard, two fish, serpent, because they're not cryptographers. They don't understand what goes into a cryptographic round, what makes it secure, how to compare them. Um, dealing with concepts, however, confidentiality and integrity, if we can find a better way to communicate exactly what the cryptography is doing without actually expecting them to know what the cryptography is or to understand what key generation is or what prime numbers are, you know, it is important, it is a failure on our part not to communicate you know, what's going on. I just think maybe we're trying to communicate the wrong things and that's getting lost up in the interface. Does that kind of answer give you want to go for? All right. Any other questions? What we got? Right. I'm glad you brought that up in a discussion at um, actually at RSA conference, and that's where Brian Snow, I'll, I'll give you a link to that video. Uh, he got into a bickering match with Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, a lot of the big cryptographers about what the, cryptog what the NSA does and does not know. He said that he believes the NSA still has the upper hand on certain types of research like nuclear, you know, missile security, command and defense, things like that that, that wouldn't necessarily concern the everyday person checking their email. But he feels that uh, as far as cryptography goes, we're pretty much at a, at a similar page, progressing very slowly because the field is very mature. He said most of the big things, as far as he, as he is aware, and he was in the NSA for decades, he says, you know, the, the, the public industry is caught up with NSA. And as far as two to three years ahead, you know, I, I guess I can see that. When you, when you lock a bunch of mathematicians in a room and tell them to work on a project, it's easier for the NSA to harness, you know, researchers and put them in a room and pay them big salaries, and that's all they do day in and day out. Whereas the public community, we're all over the world, so it's hard for us. We can get together at conferences or share papers and research. So, so yeah. I uh, just now I did. Okay. <laughs> I have not. That's that's. It's a little, it's a little racist. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I'm gonna. Uh, uh, what's that? It is not a Confederate flag. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give a okay.
sure. I have I okay. have given G Mark an unnecessary amount of shit for this for this patch. <laughs> so yes. Thank you for being a good sport. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, was it what, what was the name of your talk? I did watch. Uh, I'm not sure it was. I sure as hell didn't watch the video because he, he ain't up there. Yeah, I, well, I watched, so, so I watched the past video. If, of the same in fact, talk. all that tittering that was going on, we're like, Kerb Bob, upload the video. So it's like, no, I clicked format instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to disclose kidding. any probabilities yet. I'm going to have a few cups of that stuff and get back to you. <laughs> that so stuff I have one up here. That is rape. I'm that getting a contact. Uh, that stuff is bus. rape juice. <laughs> <laughs> it look, it, it's like a, when a water main breaks and you stick a cup under the tap. That's what it looks like. Let me, let me tell you, I've it's had like three glasses of this and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. You're ready, you're ready for Hacker Trivia now. I'm ready for Hacker Trivia. So um, let's. Wow. Let's. Let's give Justin a hand. It's really hard to be the last talk.